The prelude to this story came from Karl Marx himself. There is a spectre haunting Europe, he said. The spectre of communism. The phantom became reality in the Russian Revolution. Popular power drew a new map of Europe and British revolutionaries found themselves in head-on collision with the state. Scores of British communists were arrested and jailed on antique charges which converted resistance into a kind of treason. William Rust, the paper's first editor, was among many on the staff whose belief in the possibility of revolution here was rewarded by several months at His Majesty's pleasure. It was the Depression decade, and in 1931, pay cuts provoked a mutiny among the Atlantic fleet at Invergordon. The daily workers' support for the mutineers brought raids, censorship and arrests. We used to have to come out with blank spaces of what had been censored. They never tell you why. They just say, cut that out, cut that out, cut that out. And when you try and find out why, they say, it's not suitable. But what, what happens is that the, suddenly the CID arrive, decide to see what is being published the next day and what should be left out. You know, it's an incredible sort of situation, really, but, but it happened. And we, well, we couldn't have come out if we hadn't done what they said, you see. I got fined because the Daily Worker printed this report of the attack on the lead of the Hunger March. And I was, as managing director of the press at that time, was fined 500 pounds. Others were fined less. and. A friend of mine, Bessie White, was fined 50 pounds. And so I was in Holloway jail because I wouldn't pay. I think in, in this book, uh, Bill Russ said something about couldn't pay. Of course, it wasn't that I couldn't pay. I could have made an appeal and got the money and paid, but I was determined not to pay. In the desolate, distressed areas of Britain, resistance to the means test and to evictions was met by more arrests. Popular protest was consummated by the great hunger marches, initiated by communists in the face of fierce hostility in the TUC and the Labour Party. By the mid-30s, the daily worker had not only survived, it had expanded. Refined by Alan Hood's elegant design, the circulation grew, the paper itself grew to eight pages, and it acquired James Friel, alias Gabriel, who was to be one of Fleet Street's great cartoonists. And what's this one? Well, this one, I think, is really a terrible one. In a... One day at the work, and I realised how many paragraphs there were about people committing suicide, about people running away about people who were homeless. And in two or three days, cutting out small items from the paper, putting them in that background, now this was only two or three days. This must have been going on all the time, all over the country. So God knows what the actual casualty list was, but in the top right-hand corner, there's a returned old contemptible soldier who'd been winded, didn't get a pension, had a wife and a couple of kids, unemployed, on the door, no prospects, shaving one morning with his open-handed razor, he just cut his throat, like that. And the other one is a woman who tried to drown a baby because she couldn't keep it. A woman who ran away and left her baby because she couldn't keep it. There's so many things like that. And they say that the unemployment wage for money for a woman with a family and three or four kids was uh, 32 and sixpence. That's the sort of thing. And the budget, of course, had to be balanced and cuts had to be made. If that didn't make you mad, nothing would. When the papers run by Tories, carry horrifying stories that the worker gets his cash from Uncle Joe. They may bluster, they may rage, I just turn another page. I say it's nonsense and I ought to know Because it's my paper I'm here 
the women's editor. I was determined to get factory women, as Lenin had recommended, you see, factory correspondents writing in the paper. By now, the Daily Worker was challenging Fleet Street on its own terms, but supported by a unique reservoir of reporters, the readers. The Daily Worker drafted factory correspondents and encouraged them to use your own language, as if you were writing to a friend. Don't strive after fancy effects. But don't be so brief that you miss the real human side to the story. We want to know what the workers are thinking. British communism in the mid-1930s was also a magnet attracting not only workers, but dissident intellectuals. It was the communist resistance to the rise of fascism which attracted writers like Spender, Auden and Isherwood, and publishers like Victor Gollantz. One of the paper's greatest coups was to recruit a journalist who called himself Frank Pitcairn. He was, in fact, Claude Coburn, a maverick who'd become fed up writing for the Times. Party leader Harry Pollitt made him an offer to drop his salary from £30 to £4 a week to write for the worker. It was an offer he couldn't refuse. His dispatches from Spain, where the Republic was fighting for its life, were unforgettable. Last night, I stood at a window in Almeria and listened. Absolute silence except for first one and then another dog. Madrid and Valencia are silent tonight. But that's another sort of silence. By an incidence of small magnitude, you are aware of hundreds and thousands of people all around you. You can hear them breathing. Al Maria at night is dead. The campaign for Spain's Democratic Republic was one of the great crusades of the European left. The Times, like the other press, counseled non-interference. One of those who couldn't obey the establishment was a young communist, Ted Willis, later to become the theatre critic of the Daily Worker, and after that, the inventor of Dixon of Doc Green. <laughs> 